Um, well, first of all, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for coming along to the inaugural event of London DM25. Um, I want to say a few thank yous myself. I definitely want to thank Olivier. I think this is one of the most uh, special and uh, just precious resources that, that, that London has. And it's a, it's, a, it's a thrill to be doing this debate in such a spectacular and beautiful um, environment. Um, I also want to thank um, DM25 for inviting me to chair the event uh, this evening. I have been watching uh, the EU debate unfold with a kind of grim fascination. Um, it's kind of, you know, watching political lines get drawn and then redrawn and then just kind of scrubbed out altogether. You know, so you've got George Galloway teaming up with Nigel Farage, teaming up with Donald Trump. At the same time, you've got Jeremy Corbyn suddenly on the same side as Tony Blair, suddenly on the same side as David Cameron, who is now no longer on the same side as Boris Johnson. So it, for me, you know, for, uh, as a journalist, it's an incredibly uh, interesting uh, but grim uh, moment. And I think the, you know, the magnitude of this decision isn't one that should be underestimated. June the 23rd is something that is going to rock not just the UK and not just Europe, but I believe uh, the, the entirety of the globe. Um, and that's why I wanted to be part of this event today. I want to know what the left has to offer to this debate and uh, you know how can we intervene how can we kind of throw our uh, our reflections upon some of the big issues of the day but the main reason why i wanted to be involved was not just because of june the 23rd but it was because of june the 24th um i want to know what's going to happen to us after the referendum in or out who is going to be in control of this country on June the 24th? On June the 24th, how do we stop the bodies of more and more refugees uh, washing up onto the shores uh, of the Mediterranean? So whatever happens, there is going to be a great deal to do on June the 24th. And therefore, as London DM 25 it's our hope and our suspicion that there will be areas of agreement between the two panellists this evening, and that there may be topics within this event which are not so much areas of contention, but where the panel finds itself discussing how to forge a progressive road ahead. Traditionalists would probably argue that this doesn't make such good television. However, we think you will all agree that there are bigger things at stake, and that this event will have played a very useful role if we all come away from it with some common ground on which we can build uh, and, and, and go forward. So there are now 42 days and 12 hours left until the EU <laughs> referendum. So uh, I want to just uh, yeah, quickly introduce again who we have in the red corner and who we have in the other red corner. Um, <laughs> Here we have Aaron Bastani, um, co-founder of Navarro Media, a political commentator, and again has just done his PhD in new media and social movements. In the other red corner, Maria Prentulis, uh, <laughs> Marina Prentulis, senior lecturer in media and politics and a representative of Syriza. Now, how this is going to work, this debate, uh, is going to be that we have, um, as London DM25, selected a short list of controversial but important topics. And I'm going to put a question about one of the topics to one of the panelists and give them three minutes to discuss it. I'll then bring in the other panelist and, uh, and, give, and ask them to respond, perhaps to agree, perhaps to passionately disagree. We'll have to we'll find out together. Um, and then we'll bring in the first panelist back uh, with, a, with a right of reply. And then after that, we will have time for questions and contributions from the audience. And we're very, very keen uh, that all of you uh, get involved in the event. And so start thinking about your questions now. Um, but before I bring in the two panelists, they're going to do a, a, a quick introduction, maybe a four or so minute introduction on their position. We would just like to do a little bit of audience participation. We're not going to ask you who's voting remain, who's voting exit, but we do want to know if there's anyone in the room who hasn't yet made up their mind. So maybe a show of hands, who has made up their mind? Who is concrete on where they're going to be voting? Mm, okay, okay. 
So who, have we got anyone who is maybe a little more open to persuasion, hasn't quite decided yet? <laughs> yes, we have. We have some people. Okay, so panellists, there is everything to play for <laughs> in this room <laughs> tonight. Okay, so I would like to, I'll ask um, uh, Marina if you would like to sure. give us your four is or so minute rundown on why you have taken the political position that you have on the European Union. Okay. Thank you. First of all, let me thank you as well for inviting me here and in such a beautiful place. And it's really a pleasure to be here. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Of course. How will that affect the broadcast? I don't know if uh, there is a problem with the broadcast, is it? We should be okay. So I should shout, yeah? yeah? Okay. A little bit. <laughs> Um, so thank you, thank you for inviting me and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you and with all of that we've been in other debates before. Now let me clarify, when people say I'm the representative of Syria, Syriza, I don't work for the government or the party. It's just that I'm involved in uh, politics, I'm a member of Syriza and that's why for a long time I've been talking uh, about what is happening in Greece and Syriza in particular. So uh, I'm now campaigning with Another Europe, and I think Another Europe is affiliated to DiEM25. Uh, so we have a similar, I think, uh, view. Now I will try to focus on what is happening with the UK case. And I think we are set up big time by the Tories, all of us. So I think what is happening is that because of the po internal politics of the Conservative Party, because of the rise of UKIP, because of the leadership of Cameron and how it could be challenged within the party, they called this referendum. I don't think for a moment that they care about what the people think or that they would ever give a, uh, the possibility to the people to vote for what they really want. So I think that's where we come from. We are set up a bit by the Tories. Now, how can we get out of this uh, position? I think by not only voting in this referendum, and I believe that we should vote remain, but we should continue campaigning for change in the EU. And the thing with the EU, from my perspective, is that there are a lot of things that they are not working very well. There are issues that they have to do with democracy in the EU. There are issues which have to do with transparency in, in the EU. And I do accept all that, and I'm sure I will agree with Aaron at, a, at many uh, points that he will raise. The issue, however, for me, is to think where we should be placed if we want to bring about change. Everything is about politics, and politics is looking at the situation that you are in, how are, uh, how, what is the setup of the powers involved and where you can intervene in order to bring change. I'm, no, I'm not the left which is a little bit indulgent and will say, oh yeah, but I take my purist position and from there I will go on repeating the same thing. No, I'm in the left because I want to bring change, because I want to bring social justice, because I want less people to suffer. So for me, it's all about politics. Now, the situation in the EU, it is quite difficult. We have a bureaucracy that you were talking about, but we should remember that this bureaucracy is not only happening on these transnational institutions and level. We have something similar at national level. And yet, we still go and vote, and we still believe in democracy, although I think there is a lot we, 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 that we would like to change and a lot that we aspire to. This technocracy in the EU, I think lately, and especially if you think the case of Greece, mm -hmm. it is connected with neo neoliberalism. And it is one is embedded in the other. So when Schäuble, in the case of Greece was, Greece, was talking about the rules of the EU and it doesn't matter what the people of Greece will vote in their referendum, what he meant is that he was interpreting rules and he was pushing them towards the direction that it will help his own party and the main forces within the EU. And these are neoliberal forces. So for me, there is one solution. The solution is we try to change 
these powers within the EU. And in order to do that, we have to work on different levels. We, first of all, I think we should change the Tory governments across Europe. This is a given for me. We cannot go on like that. But I don't think this is enough. And again, on the, on the level of national democracies, I don't have so, so much um, faith in our democratic systems. This is why I believe that at the same time we have to create transna transnational pan-European movements that they will support these changes, they will push the new governments that, they will put, that we will put in place to make the changes that we want and they will fight on the grassroots level. So for me, if we want change, it has to work on all three levels together. Grassroots strong movements, national governments, get rid of neoliberal, conservative, Tory governments, especially in Britain. And then within the transnational institutions, take over. It's our institutions and we have to claim them back. So I will finish with one thing. This is my left position. If you give them an inch, they will take a mile. I will not give them anything. <laughs> Kanzi, can you can we please use the microphones? But can I have Olivier turn the sound down in this room if that's You don't mean I have to repeat that? Right? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we so, um, so we are we're going to use we're going to use the microphones. We're going to use the microphones simply because we are recording the event for the 500 million people who couldn't come along <laughs> from Europe but really want to watch the, the debate. So um, so we will use them, but I think they're turned down. So is, are people happy with the sound? Yeah. Okay, fab. Right, Aaron, saying from you, please. Set out your political position wow. on the EU. Um, in four minutes. You hear me okay? Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Is it on? Yeah. 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 It's really loud. Um, so despite the fact that I have a graduate education, I have a mixed heritage, I live in London, um, I'm on the left, I should be the last person entertaining the ideas that I do, demographically, I should be very rare. Nonetheless, I think there's some validity to what I think, the reasons why I think Brexit's a great idea, why Britain would be better at the EU, why I think the EU itself probably, probably would be uh, better eliminated. So what are they? Well, let's start from the beginning. First of all, and I think we all agree on this, the EU has a horrendous deficit of democracy. Now, people have been talking about this for decades, okay? You could say, well, look, the European Parliament, it's selected, you know, it has some competences. It's, it couldn't be more shambolic. The Scottish Parliament has more powers than the European Parliament, and that's just how the European Commission likes it. The European Commission is unelected. That's where all the power is. External trade policy, right? When we're ripping off sub-Saharan Africa, when we're destroying Kenyan flower farmers, it's being done by the European Commission, and you can't get rid of these people. And I think that's absolutely astonishing that that's even permitted by European publics in the 21st century. And then some people rejoin to that. They go, well, look, commissioners are brought from the level of the nation state, and each country gives their commissioner, and that's kind of democratic. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? This is ridiculous. But, I mean, who, who, who? Can you really imagine Peter Mandelson being democratically elected as a commissioner for trade <laughs> or industry? I mean, of course not, right? It's almost like the House of Lords, but these people actually have power. I mean, it's very, very scary, really, when you think about it. So democracy is a big issue for me. And that leads on to number two, which is um, the EU is moving in a direction where socialist policies aren't just uh, <coughs> not preferred. They're becoming illegal, right? So the implementation of TTIP would obviously be the culmination of this. But it feeds into this this idea of, it was, it was re referred to earlier on, the European social model, European social model. So what is the European social model? I mean, in my head, yeah, sure, I think 40 hour working week, uh, free higher education, great infrastructure, good wages, you know, a minimum, minimum wage, at least 60% of the average wage, right? Functioning public services, but let's be honest, that isn't the European social model anymore. And actually, I don't think it's sustainable under capitalism as it currently exists, okay? Again, maybe we disagree. I don't think it's sustainable under capitalism as it exists. You'd have to have, a, I think, a revolutionary, a systemic change in the nature of global capitalism to maintain that model, right? Which isn't even asking for that much, okay? So that's one. Uh, two, I won't go into too much about TTIP because you know, it may not even happen. Uh, number three again, 
<coughs> excuse me, external trade. I mean, this is just astonishing. Bernie Sanders comes out and he goes, I hate CAFTA, I hate NAFTA, I hate the TPP, I hate TTIP. Good. You should hate them. They're very bad for working people in the United States. They're very bad for working people across the world and the global south too. Jeremy Corbyn is going, the EU, it's great for growth and jobs. These are the exact same policies, right? Now, Jeremy Corbyn has the very, very similar, I'd say far more radical politics than Bernie Sanders. He's hamstrung politically. He has to say this stuff. But that's the reality of the situation. He's having to defend an economic status quo where the European Union has trade policies which systematically seeks to underdevelop the global south. Has for 50 years. Did with the Cotonou Agreement. It's now doing it with these things called economic partnership agreements. Great example, I said Kenyan flowers. Ken, you know, so Kenya wasn't going to implement one of these economic partnership agreements, right? They weren't going to have it. And Kenya is a big exporter of cut stems onto the European market, flowers. So the Europeans say, well, we're going to slap a tariff into your flowers. These, see, these are literally some of the poorest farmers you can imagine, right? We're going to stick a tariff on your exports, and you're all going to go bust. And you're going to feed your families if you don't accept this economic, this, uh, economic partnership agreement, it's EPA. Okay, so that's how Europe plays with the global south. That's where a lot of this wealth comes from. I think the European model, quote unquote, over the last 50, 60 years, has been premised on a privileging vis-a-vis -vis precisely these countries. I would call it colonialism. Okay, Maybe some people disagree. I'd also call it imperialism. Uh, again, some might disagree. This is also primarily conducted at the level of the nation state. I'm not going to say that this is all oh, poor little Britain. And, you know, the city of London is the conduit for 21st century imperialism. Unbelievable. So we've got democratic deficit. We've got, they're going to make socialism illegal. It's kind of already illegal. Uh, we've got the issue of external trade policy. Finally, free borders. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds, well, okay. We're all for free borders. We are all internationalists. I love the idea of free borders everywhere, absolutely. But let's not be under any uh, mistake, right? We've got free borders for economic white migration within the European Union for approximately 450 million people. Meanwhile, the Mediterranean is the epicenter for undocumented deaths worldwide, right? I think two thirds now of deaths by land and sea crossings of undoc undocumented migrants are happening in the Mediterranean, yeah? That's, that was known when the European Union's interior ministers didn't replace Murray Nostrum properly. They gave it tr Triton instead. They knew this was going to happen. So the free borders, the open borders we love, are about economic white migrants undercutting each other internally. Increasingly, that will mean the most militarized external borders in the world. Brilliant. OK, I've noticed a couple of people on their phones uh, tweeting and stuff like that. Um, the hashtag for tonight, I just wanted to add, is LUNDM25, L-O-N. D I E M twenty five, and that is uh, that's the Lundiem Twitter handle as well. We're at Lundiem twenty five. Okay, so we have had a you know a, a whistle stop tour of uh, of where both of our panelists are coming from. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper into some of the issues, and the first one uh, that we're going to talk about is jobs. Now there was an interesting event with Yanis Varoufakis a couple of weeks ago. Um, in London uh, where he was kind of going through everything that was wrong with the EU and the audience kind of reacted to him saying hey but like what about all the stuff that's good about the EU that think you know they've done well one of these things um, is uh, I think it can, can be argued um, is that the EU is the gold standard for employment paid leave lunch breaks maternity hours health and safety protection against discrimination and so on so but there are those in industry and in government who argue that high employment standards make Britain uncompetitive <coughs> and that we should be deregulating our labour market to compete with countries like China. So the UK is at a fork in the road. What's it going to look like in the future? Is it going to retain its high standards or move to a more um, American-like situation based on hire and fire contracts and workers having two weeks holiday um, a year. So my question is for Aaron, first of all, isn't it an argument that, uh, to, l that to leave the EU <coughs> would be to forfeit the protection of Europe's employment law and potentially expose millions of workers in this country to a deregulated US style system of employment? Why would you want millions of people to leave the gold standard? Right, so I like to think of um, Thatcherism as a counter-revolution. Okay, and I don't know if you know, but we were in the EU when that happened. 
Okay, we were in the EU, Britain, British Trade Union movement, strongest in the world, 1974, top to government. By 1985, it's decimated. Now, that happened while we were in the EU. Now, the idea that the EU is a kind of safeguard against us, this stuff, I think, is just incorrect. What you're saying, the assertion is absolutely true, right? Absolutely true. In terms of labour standards, all these things, absolutely true. They're written into statute domestically. If we leave the EU, that, that stuff would have to be changed at the domestic level, right? So we'd have a few years. My wager would be we can have a, we can have a left coalition government by then to not make, well, make sure that doesn't happen. In terms of protection, however, look, there's the Thatcherite model. There's the European social model. Europe is moving towards the former, right? We're not going towards the latter. The rest of Europe is, is over time, approximating the British model. The idea that you use a safeguard against this stuff is kind of, it's not born out in the evidence. You know, there's, no, there's no factual kind of empirical evidence showing this, right? And also the opt-outs, sorry. Britain's opted yeah. out of loads of this stuff anyway, so we're not even in Schengen. Um, Marina, what, what do you think about that? Do you think that employment law is a, is, is a space that you know, people should be sticking up for the EU? Is it working? Yeah, good. Is it? Yes. 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 Well, I think one of the reasons that I will say let's remain in the EU is because of these minimal protections. I don't disagree with what Aaron said, that we are moving towards a very different direction and labor rights are in danger across uh, the EU. But still, there are some directives. Actually, I don't want to imagine what would happen in Thatcherism even if we were not in the EU. And the only thing that this country has exported so well, it's Thatcherism. And this is what we have to face now. So there was a different vision of a social uh, EU. There was the neoliberal Thatcherite vision, and now we know who won. But this is why to stick in there and fight for that. I want to say one thing about the employment law in particular. The employment law that we have is specially things that they are supporting the most vulnerable. And the discrimination legislation for women and equal pay, for fixed term and part-time contracts, for all those that they suffer and in the process and the young people will suffer more in their, um, uh, in their uh, jobs. We had directives. We had directives for, directives, for example, for fixed term I mean, part-time part contracts so they are not exploited all the time by employees. By the time I finished, I, I was in a campaign like that as uh, trade union secretary. The moment I changed my job and I turned my head, this, this, in this country, they had put zero hour contracts. That was the national response. And now they are exporting the zero hour contracts as, in as a response to these minimum protections that we have in other countries as well, like Greece. We have to fight. And what you were saying about these uh, protections and so on, the reason why uh, it is important to fight on the national level, of course, is because the EU is giving directives and some directions, and it's not going to protect us if we don't give the national battles as well to change the neoliberal governments, and if we don't have a strong, much stronger movement than we have now on the ground. Thank you. And all right, Aaron, right of reply. Very quick. I mean, New Zealand's just, they've basically scrapped zero contracts. Mm -hmm. That was the ground zero of neoliberalism in the mid 80s. Um, and you know, people say the United States, it's terrible, right? But I actually think the US is moving in a really good direction. Same sex marriage, trans rights, drug decriminalization, and on economic stuff, right? Minimum wage for fast food workers, $15 an hour. That's happening because of social movements, okay? And that's the only way you're going to change this. Any reliance on a sort of bureau bureaucratic structure of transnational level to defend this stuff is so weak and I think yeah I agree with Marina fundamentally that I, I just think I probably have a lot more emphasis on the national level and the social movements and you've got this other element which I, I think maybe that would I think it's not really a place to contest power. Okay. Are you respond? So go, go on about employment rights. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
these days, because as you said, and I agree with you, all these employment rights are under threat in the EU, you have the European Trade Union, um, um, the ETUC, which is trying to push again this idea of labor rights within the treaties of the EU. So we are giving a battle, and this battle, and this is our important difference, for me, I think it has to happen on all these different levels at the same time. Okay, first, this is our first bonus question. Bonus, um, bonus question. Uh, okay, bear with me. I know that this is not going to be a very popular topic. But because this event is taking place in the shadow of Canary Wharf, I am very interested to get our panellists' views upon this. So one of the things that's being held up uh, as a big kind of employment issue and something we're all supposed to be really worried about is the effect that Brexit could have on uh, the City of London. We're told that it could go into into decline and i know i'm well aware that probably everyone in this room uh, hates bankers uh, as much <laughs> as everyone outside this room but um banking i have learned in the last few days accounts uh, for a tenth of the economy and an eighth of the taxes that the government receives and is the uk's biggest industry so bonus question what i want to know from our two panelists is is there any reason why people in this country should be worried about a possible effect on the City of London were we to have Brexit? So, shall I start? Yeah, go yeah. for it. I think in all these debates, and I want to go a little bit outside the left because sometimes the debates between us is not the general debates that they are happening. Both sides of city, the city of London came uh, for both sides of the campaign. And I think some economists said, you may know who it was. He said, if you interrogate the facts for a long time, you will make them confess. So, <laughs> you know who it is, yeah? <laughs> uh, so the facts, if we look at that, it can go both ways. I wish there was something that it will minimize the power that the city of London has. But because a lot of my comrades from either side, I mean our two sides, they talk about international capital. And it is international capital. And it is international banking system. And what it does is that it goes beyond borders. You, and this is one of the problems that sometimes I think I have with the other left position. You're not going to block it because you're going to close the door. If it was that easy, we would be so much happier. Mm -hmm. This is why also I believe we should have a transnational, <coughs> international <coughs> response to the banking system, to try to control them, not only in one country, because we know what they will say, oh, we are going to take our stuff and go somewhere else. That's how, what they do. If they are pushed in one country, they try to play country against country, and they go for free. This is why, for all these issues, we, we need transnational responses. Okay, Aaron, should we be worried? Should we be happy? Um, so office building in London is is a breakneck pace. It's never been quicker. So obviously people aren't that w investors aren't that worried in Brexit. So I suppose the city kind of is um, indifferent. Uh, I think they would obviously prefer. Obviously the status quo obviously serves their interest more than leaving because it creates risk. But I think they'd be confident they'd still do pretty well out of things. Nigel Farage used to be a commodity trader, so you know. Um, in terms of um, Oh, what was I going to say? In terms of uh, no country can do much, I mean, yesterday, well, we had this, on, this joke anti-corruption summit in the UK at the moment. And I'm sure some of, you, some of you may have seen this. I think there's five heads of state, well, four heads of state, plus obviously the British Prime Minister President, right? Now, two of these heads of state were just completely taken through the mud. The Nigerian President and then Ghani from Afghanistan, they were both kind of, you know, two most corrupt countries. Well, we installed the regime in one and we, you know, we took all the assets from the other for a century, so I mean, there's kind of an explanation there. But um, Britain and its crown dependencies really are the infrastructure. They are the broadband through which um, international, international tax avoidance, uh, a lot of this stuff works. And you're saying, well, what could one country do? Again, if we have a left government, whether we stay or whether we leave the EU, a left government in this country, which wants to nail these crown dependencies, could do it. And because it hasn't happened for so long, things like capital control, so on, we think, oh, it's not possible. You could do it, you know. If you send soldiers there if you have to and shut the places down, literally take the banks down and shut them down, right? 
Uh, I doesn't have capital controls. They still have capital controls. I've had it for five, six years. We were told before 2007, <laughs> this doesn't happen. Well, it happens, right? Um, so yeah, I think one country can. That's a great example of one country making a difference is we'd shut down these crown dependencies. Uh, in terms of the city, nobody should care less. We should nationalise all of these banks and they should be, um, <laughs> they should have multiple uh, metrics which to judge investment and profit shouldn't be top. I, I agree with that. It's just that uh, I'm thinking, where are we going to do that? And of course, Greece is not the same like Britain. We are talking about totally different economic powers there. But what we've learned from this experience is that you need a lot of different countries and alliances across the board if you want to make a serious change. Great. Thank you. OK, so we're going to move on to our next uh, controversial but important topic and that is that of immigration. So in 2014, 174,000 new EU migrants arrived in the UK. How EU many? 174,000. <coughs> um, EU migrants now make up 5% of our population. Um, interesting uh, footnote, about half of the immigration into the UK comes from outside of the EU. Um, just a footnote there. Um, it's argued, and I don't just mean by UKIP, this is a, an argument that we hear from the RMT, the Rail Workers uh, Union, that an influx of, my, of EU migrants puts a downward pressure on wages and increases competition for low-skilled jobs. So my question uh, is for Marina, and that is, does the EU actually create a buyer's market for labour and undermine labour struggles for improved conditions. Wouldn't British workers actually be better off out? No, I think it's exactly the opposite, and it goes. My argument will go in the same way like the previous one. We cannot allow them to play one country against another country. Now, I don't know where you got this figure because yesterday I was reading an article which was where the statistics of migration come from, and there is quite a dispute. So there are some statistical figures coming from the nas uh, national insurance applications and uh, other sources, and it's not totally clear. But what it is clear in this country, and this is what scares me a lot, is how much immigration from within the EU has become a huge issue in the mainstream media and for the Brexit campaign. I find them scary. There is no, there, there is hate, pure hate, xenophobia, racism, and nobody anywhere discusses the contribution of uh, the migrant workers. And I think here we all we would all agree that their contribution is much greater greater than what they get um, back. But so the one issue is about uh, U uh, European immigration internally. I mean. And I wish somebody would stand up and will say the truth. And the truth is that some of us, we are Europeans. Britain, for a very long time, has played both worlds. We want that and we don't want that. We will give them benefits or we will withdraw them back. I have to say to this government, F you. You cannot <laughs> have it both ways. Either you are in or you are not in. I want Britain in. I want us to remain, but with the recognition that it is a European country and European citizens will be moving around and this is one of our basic um, rights. Now, there is an issue, however, with external migration as well and what is happening there. And again, Britain is the exception. And again, Britain doesn't sign to EU, re EU regulations about immigrants and chooses and cherry picks and says, no, I will decide on case to case basis. And I want this as well to stop. And migration is going to be a huge issue in the future because we have managed to destroy the environment. And then there will be flows of mm -hmm. immigrants and they will come in from the parts of the world that the West has contributed a lot in destroying and destroying the environment. How are we going to tackle these issues? Again, my response is only collectively we will be able to deal with these issues. If you allow the situation that it is 
today and how in Britain certain things are perceived where everybody will close their borders and say, oh no, yes, but we are a small country and we can't and so on. No, we will not manage to deal with these situations. Again, it's about unity. And again, it's about having a European Union, not as it is right now, but a European Union that we will create. Thank you, Rena. And so, Aaron, let's let's hear from you now. I mean, you, uh, as someone who's backing Brexit, you have ended up on the side of people like Nigel Farage. Does that worry you that you um, that you might be playing into the hands of certain reactionary forces who just want to kick everybody out? No. no, I mean, my dad didn't have a passport. My dad was a refugee. He didn't have a passport till 2010. Um, so, you know, he was here from 1979, the Iranian Revolution. Um, so I've seen how bad the system is. But um, no, I'm not worried at all. I mean, the thing is, I don't think UKIP is a scalable political project in this country. I'll tell you why. It's limited to the over 50s. Okay? Labour won the last general election amongst under 45s. 51% of 18 to 24 year olds voted Green or Labour. Okay? So I think, yes, there are lots of these people, they're very vocal, and yes, they turn out at elections. But I don't think, actually, in terms of civil society, there's a critical mass of these people for a popular project. I just don't think it would happen. If there was, this is on 23rd, right? The referendum? Yes. 24th. <laughs> if there was a demo on the 24th, on the 25th, I could, I could imagine, you know, the refugees demo, for instance, was called at such short notice, the left would be able to get on the streets. Whatever the outcome, you know, 60, 70, 80,000 people, the right can't do it. It's limited. It's much more micro-political to be 60 people kicking somebody's head in, in I don't know, Romford or something, you know. It's much more, yeah, it's much more uh, microscopic. In terms of big political mo mobilisation and con in sort of in uh, in defiance of anybody like Nigel Farage, I really trust the left, and I think it's a much more scalable politics in the long term, especially by the middle of the next decade. So I'm not worried at all. It just I want to talk about quickly about the migration issue. I mean, there's a particular dynamic in the UK which is most wealth, most resources go to London. Now, some of these people in very isolated communities, public services that are crap, real wages have been flatlining for a long time living standards flatlining for a very long time, and they mistakenly blame, yes, European migrants, also Muslims, and they say, that's why things are crap. A particular dynamic we have in Britain, which you don't necessarily have so much in Greece or Spain or Italy, is this metropolis sucking in resources, sucking in talent, sucking in money, and I think that's, a, that's another major explanation which is uh, really specific to the UK, and also explains partly why Scots are much, more, uh, much less Eurosceptical than Brits. Uh, this is why they will live in Brexit. Uh, but uh, something else, and I'm telling you that because we have both studied media, yeah, you know that the mainstream narrative is so much against mm -hmm. immigration and they go on forever. There are all these issues about uh, the referendum and they have managed to put immigration in Britain at the top of the agenda well, and we have to change it. I mean, that was a project that was constructed over 10 years in the print media. You know, the two biggest red papers in this country, Daily Mail, The Sun, over 50% of market share, both owned by tax avoiders, right? They don't even pay their tax. So, yeah, and I, that, that isn't just an actual outgrowth of British sentiment. I've seen that with my own eyes, really, two eyes, really since the mid-1990s, really. And remember, so start thinking about what questions you might have for the panellists. I know quite a few of us in this room wouldn't exist were it not for various bits of migration into the UK. So it'd be really good to hear from, you know, from as many of you uh, as possible at the end. Okay, so we're going to move on. Um, to a, a, another controversial but very important issue which is intrinsically linked again to, uh, to, to immigration and that is the question of, of refugees. So just to put, um, just to give you a few figures, I mean th this is a, a debate and a discussion that has been, has gone from one about people and human so uh, stories just to one about facts, uh, about figures and, and, and quotas. Um, but so just but just to add you know just to give you some more figures um there are now four four and a half million um refugees from syria in five countries turkey lebanon jordan iraq and egypt more than a million migrants and refugees crossed into europe in 2015 and we know that at least 3770 refugees died trying to cross the Mediterranean in 2015. Most of them died coming from North Africa to Italy, but more than 800 died crossing the Aegean from Turkey to Greece. Um, 
we don't we at Lundy M25 we decided we didn't want to use the issue of refugees uh, as a, a political football um, so we are actually more we want to hear from the two panelists about where you think the refugee crisis has come from how you think it can or can't be solved or ameliorated and what the EU and the UK need to do with regards to this issue both at this point in time and perhaps on, on the 24th as well. So I'm going to go to Aaron first. Um, well, yeah, the, we are seeing the first sort of flickers of, of the refugee crisis. I, mean, I don't know what, this will, what the Wikipedia article will be called in 2040, because <coughs> it's a lot bigger than that. Africa's population, Sub-Saharan Africa's population, Sub-Saharan, sorry, I didn't get much sleep last night. Sub-Saharan Africa's population dub is going to double between now and 2050. Because of climate change, crop yields could decline by one third. Okay? So twice the people, maybe one third the arable land, you'd probably imagine a lot of people will be leaving. If you look at the whole of North Africa, all the way into Central Asia, there's basically a straight line of countries, with a couple of exceptions, which could very plausibly become failed states. Now clearly these people, quite rightly, are gonna go to the place where they will be able to find work, s political safety, sanctuary, but also just, you know, uh, increasingly just, yeah, safety generally. Um, so yeah, they're going to be coming to Europe, and there's going to be lots of them, and that, that is an intersection of a couple of things. Security crunch, the end of American empire, um, uh, climate change, and yeah, that's the two major ones. And a, and a failure of neoliberalism, right? I mean, if you look at, for instance, interesting hypotheses around why the Arab Spring kicks off, if you look at the political economy of a lot of North African countries, they're deindustrializing throughout the early 1990s as China and India all of a sudden start making loads of textiles and stuff, right? So there's actually a really good structure analysis for why Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt eventually move into a, you know, a, a situation where they could become revolutionary after 2010. That starts actually a couple of decades earlier for some people. So the refugee crisis is only beginning. It's only going to get worse. Um, and yeah, I'm obviously very concerned about that. I don't, again, I don't really see much of a solution for under capitalism. Um, if you look at demographic change, the United States, I think, is projected to become a minority majority country by 2040 something, okay? Which means there's no overall ethnic minority, i.e. white people are an ethnic minority. So when white people at Trump rallies go, we're gonna become an ethnic minority, it's true, right? So the left has to start saying, yes, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, there's a similar thing going on <coughs> in Britain. Britain's expected to become a minority-majority country, I think, by the 2060s, 2070s. The same is happening with Europe, right? Demographics are happening. So like I say, doubling in um, sub-Saharan Africa. We've had higher birth rates across, across the Middle East, Muslim countries for a long time now. And white Europe has had below birth, rate, below birth replacement rates for a long time, right? So Europeans are living longer, they're having fewer children. So that means that the average European by the end of this century, will be brown. There'll be fewer blonde people, there'll be fewer white people. That's not a racist thing. I'm not saying that as a good, it's, it's ethically neutral, right? But that's the reality of the situation. Now, when you have political consent, you have whole political parties. And I don't just mean UKIP, I mean the Conservative Party, right? I mean, uh, you know, new democracy. I mean the historic parties of Christian democracy and the, the centre-right in Europe. They are based on ethnic homogeneity. So given that, I just really wonder how they'll respond. Um, I suppose we've already had a foretaste of it with the United States, and the left seems to be doing pretty damn well, and I, I, I can't see Trump ever being a, a president for the precise reasons of outline demographic change. He could never win Florida, California, too many Latinos. I could be wrong, of course. But um, yeah, so it's a huge catastrophe, and the left has to meet it. Okay, uh, Marina, why do you believe that the EU is, is, is part and parcel of solving or ameliorating or figuring out the, the, the refugee crisis and the, the crisis of migration that we're facing? I, I know that I'm repeating myself that I have to go again and say because of political reasons. First of all, I have to start by saying that what we saw in the EU is the failure and a huge crisis, failure to deal with the refugee crisis, to accommodate the people, to deal in a legal way with the refugees that they were crossing from Greece, Italy, and so on. So it, there, it shows its weakness, it, that it, it, is a, it wasn't able to show the political will and the union that it should have shown according to its founding 
principles. I have to say here as well that I don't like at all the deal between EU and Turkey. I don't consider er Erdogan's Turkey a safe country. I think it is a deal that it is against international law and UN Convention uh, on Refugees. I think it is um, a deal which is against what the EU charters on fundamental rights are arguing. And I think there we saw that we have to change this EU. We have to change it. This wasn't a response. This wasn't a European response. What happened instead is that they passed the problem to where they could, just to get it out of their door, you know. Turkey, other people should take um, our problem. So this shows us that the EU should change. But at the same time, we saw what was happening, that what stopped the solution to this problem was nationalisms. And one of the big differences I think I have with Aaron is that I am very much more pessimistic about where the left is as it is right now. What we see is the emergence of nationalisms, Austria closing borders, everybody building borders and refusing to take the political responsibility and the political solution, legal solution that they should. So I do believe the EU is in crisis. I do believe it failed. But if we want to deal with these issues, we have to have unity, na not nationalism, and deal with it collectively. I, mean, I guess one of the unknown, the things we can't know, but we can kind of speculate about, <clears throat> would be the, the response of Austria and, and Hungary to the refugee crisis if they weren't constrained even by the, you know by the, by the EU and, and Poland uh, as well do you think it do you think it would be even worse if we didn't I, have I, the EU? I think they would have done it much easier and without some of us saying hang on what is going on there but this is the problem I think this is the big threat of the EU it's not going to be brexit is the, and it's not going to be the left by the way, we are not there. I see the other side which wants to divide the EU. They are organized. Austria and Hungary had meetings outside the EU, so there is a division already happening there, and they're pushing their own policies, which is very nationalistic and only thinking of how they won't have to deal with the problem. This is why I believe we, we are very far behind them. The left is not the one winning in this case. It's very different forces. This is why I think we should stay in and fight. I mean, Aaron, sure, I mean, like, surely you, you could see the sense that, I mean, the left is not winning on the refugee crisis, is it? And the forces of reaction across Europe are dominating the, the dialogue I and the agree. policy. <clears throat> I mean, Greece last year took 800,000 people, I think, was that right? Uh, they passed a through. The, uh, 800,000 by sea landed in Greece last yeah. year, right? Um, I mean, that's just astonishing. I just don't know how a country can even cope with that, how the Greek people not only cope with that, but elect a left-wing government. Um, if you look at France, but also go back further. So I think at the start of the 1990s, Spain, only one or two percent of Spaniards were non-native born. That's a lot, lot higher now. A lot of people left out to do that, but it's a lot higher now. And there's been no right-wing kickback. Okay, the left has grown over that period of time. The right hasn't done across Southern Europe because the big colonial powers, Britain, France, were meant to be comfortably multicultural societies, right? And all of a sudden, Southern Europe actually has more brown and black people, right? And they're very stable, and actually they're voting for left-wing governments. So I'm actually very confident about a lot of these things. I just want to make a quick point about the nature of Europe, which is you're looking at a, const a constellation, I think, of three groups of country, right? You've got the south, you've got the north, and then I say you've got the east, okay? Now, the north has these very peculiar, ultra I won't call them fascist, ultra-nationalist parties. Uh, Builders is now, they're polling number one in the Netherlands, UKIP's doing superbly, the Front National's doing pretty well, and so on. But don't even look at the votes, they're channeling something which is approaching a mainstream orthodoxy, actually, right? In a lot of these countries. True Finns in Finland. You've got the North, and they also prefer fiscal austerity. And they almost, they almost hate Southern Europeans as much as they hate these people coming from like Syria and Afghanistan, some of them. Okay? That's the North. Then you've got the South. They are the, materially, they're affected by the refugee crisis more than anybody else, okay? And they are pro. Um, uh, deficit uh, funded sort of counter-cyclical stimuli. They want to run deficits to have a bigger state 
to create GDP growth and create jobs. So there's an economic difference and a difference with refugees. Then you've got the East. Now I think if we had the old EU, the pre-2004 EU, this could be saved. I think this could be saved. But I think it's too big with too many divergent interests and cultural values. I don't think that, that can work anymore. So the East has a, com a very different economic model. It's much more ethnically homogenous. That doesn't exist, by the way, but they think it exists. It's much more ethnically homogenous. And it doesn't really have any history or culture of multiculturalism. right? And I just don't think that these three families can work together. Maybe two of them could. I think the North and the South could. But the three of them together I don't think will work. I'm, this is an empirical observation. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'd like to bring you back in on, on that point. I think, I, I, th I think what you are saying, there is something in there. And the, we, what we saw with the crisis, especially with the Greek crisis and the negotiations, is how the European Union is divided and how I mean, Schäuble even, even proposed that, that we should have a core and a periphery, and periphery meant neocolonization. Neo yeah. So there are forces in there, but I think we have to stop that. And I have to say, in terms of the southern countries, it's not that they, we have created anything, any unity, and any different bloc yet. So always when we are thinking, I think, how we move forward, we have to assess where we are. And we haven't made progress in different alliances on the one hand, and the other side is very much willing to divide us and win from that. Okay, I'm sure a lot of you will have a lot to say about this issue when we come um, to, for, for questions. I'm going to move on to issue number five, and that is the environment. It's been touched upon a little bit in the presentations. Now, in the 1970s and the 80s, Britain had the reputation for being one of the filthiest, dirtiest countries in Europe had the highest sulfur dioxide emissions in the EU and seas that were like sewers because we were pumping human effluent into them. European environmental policies, which have accumulated quietly since the 1970s, address almost every aspect of uh, environmental protection. They protect our drinking and bathing water, uh, landfills, emissions, habitats, air pollution, and of course the big one, climate change. They con constitute one of the most comprehensive bodies uh, of environmental protection law in anywhere in the world today. Membership, or indeed leaving the EEA, uh, would mean that the UK government no longer has to be bound by European law on these issues. And many people today, particularly with the issue of climate change, believe that it requires a unified transnational response. So my question <coughs> is for Aaron. What would you say to people who argue that only through cooperation with our European neighbours can we address forthcoming environmental challenges? Don't yawn at the question. No, no, I'm not wasn't yawning. I was no, I was clearing my throat. <laughs> so, yeah, so unilateral action in one state can't, cannot address something like climate change. I'm sure you agree on that. So if we can't cooperate on the EU, how are we going to cooperate in fixing the planet? But we've got, look, we've got all these multilateral organisations and supranational organisations like the EU. We've got the G20, the G8, the IMF, the WTO, the World Bank, mm. you know. And, you know, we're going to hell, and, you know, we're going to hell pretty quickly, right? By, I think, there's a great book, Climate Capitalism, and the upper estimates of the IPCC report in terms of climate change. Look at two thirds of the world's biggest cities underwater by 2060. That book's Climate Capitalism, I'm not making this up. <coughs> and that, that stat is on Google Books if you go and, go and look for it. So. It's a huge problem. We've got all these supranational, transnational, multilateral organisations, and they're not meeting these challenges. And I think the solution is, like Marina said, politics, and it has to come from social movements. And I think they get the most leverage, the most success, at the level of the nation state, because they can remove holders of public office. We can't do that at the European level at the moment. If we could, then I'd say, great. But no, and th this particularly, <clears throat> yes, it's been great for, the EU's been great for, <clears throat> clean beaches and so on and so forth. But it's one of those issues where, yes, it's got an outstanding record. Does that make up for some of the other stuff? Probably not. I mean, it's got nice aid policy, for instance, right, with a lot of the countries I started at the beginning talking about. It's got great aid policy. But that's like a, that's like a plaster on its abysmal trade policy, right? It's almost like so corporate social responsibility. So uh, I don't think so. And also its current um, environmental standards are nowhere near good enough if we want to 
if we want to even make a dent in climate change, which isn't going to happen anyway, to be honest. I'm just going to pull you off on one thing, because I don't think this is about clean beaches. I think this is about the working class of this country having access to clean drinking water. But that's water the meme, isn't it? And having, that's the meme. having one air of the that we can actually breathe. Well, London Air, is a bit, no, I, I'm an asthmatic. I, I, you know, I was in Bournemouth to see my dad until yesterday, until today, and I come to London, I can't breathe. So again, if the EU is so great, why are NO2 levels in London going through the roof? But isn't that something that we would be better off fixing as a... As well, a politics group? fixes it. I just don't think politics which appeals to change at the level of the EU is the politics that fixes it. I think we need to change the domestic government. Interesting. Marina, yeah. should we just ride roughshod yeah. over <laughs> decades of environment? This is all still in statute, by the way. Like, if we left the EU tomorrow, it would be a big job to get rid of it all, which uh, yeah, they could do. I, uh, I have to say, I don't think, first of all, we are going to get rid of capitalism any day soon. Um, yeah? I'm not saying okay. this. And I'm the other saying thing right I'm saying vote for Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the other thing is that, yeah, I don't think the EU is uh, great as well. But we have to think again where we are. And if you look at all the discussions that they are happening in relation to TTIP, and from people that they write about TTIP, and probably they will be much closer to your position in terms of the referendum. They all agree that the EU standards that we have in terms of the environmental standards, I mean, they're much higher than the EU, the, the US. And this is why TTIP is a huge threat because it's going to destroy that. So I think we already have something there, not enough, but I think the EU is much further ahead than, for example, the US, and I do believe we have to fight uh, TTIP. Now, there was the Paris Agreement, yeah. I don't think it's doing enough, I don't think it's doing it fast enough. But again, the difficulty of managing to have so many different countries coming together and having even a minimum agreement, it is something. So again, the environment, it is something that I see in the unity how we are going uh, to fight. And of course, when it comes to TTIP as well, again, I believe the same thing. That within the EU, we are fighting TTIP much better than what is going to happen if Britain leaves mm -hmm. the EU. Because then, we won't have Corbyn yet. It will take a little bit. We will have a Tory government negotiating a Tory government which cares about the interest of the city rather than the interest of the people. And the agreements that they will make will be subjected to the same body that the TTIP agreements at, at the beginning were supposed to be under. Uh, investor state dispute settlement, which is multinational lawyers effectively dealing with any dispute that it will happen. So while within the EU we are fighting TTIP, we are making some progress, and I think we will manage to stop it. I don't want to think what will happen if Britain goes out and you have a Tory government negotiating for the interest of big businesses. Can I just, I mean, if, I mean, if you look at where leadership's come on the big issues, Italy, Operation Mare Nostrum, they deployed basically the whole Italian Navy Search and rescue operations throughout the Mediterranean. They saved a heck of a lot of people, right? Leadership came from Italy. I'm not. I'm not a big nationalist. I'm just. Again, it's just an observation. The EU replaces it with Operation Triton. They just do basically 12 kilometres around the you know seaboard, right? Which has basically led to thousands of people dying, and they knew that was going to happen. Nuclear. Well, you might not agree with nuclear, but transitioning to a you know a very different kind of um, energy economy. Germany. There was real leadership there. Why? Because of domestic pressures. I just don't see any of this stuff happening at the level of of Europe. I mean, well, I mean, if I'd been if I'd been writing uh, this debate a couple of weeks ago, I would have had an entire question on TTIP. But in, it does, you know, it does now look like it may not happen, which is an extraordinary feat uh, for campaigners, uh, right? You know, uh, across Europe uh, and and in, in America as well. But um, I mean, Aaron, I've seen you argue uh, for uh, that TTIP is one of the big reasons why we should leave the EU. What do you think? I mean, Marie's point that if Britain was outside of the European Union, it would be more susceptible to hideous trade deals like TTIP rather than less susceptible. Okay. And, I, and it does appear that Britain has actually been one of the driving forces behind TTIP in the European Union. So a lot of this stuff, TTIP, TPP, between the US and Asian countries, um, a lot of this stuff came about because of the failure of the WTO in the early noughties. 
about 15 years ago, the Global South said, we're not going to have this anymore with uh, the Global North, right? So all of a sudden, the EU, the US, Japan, has to go, God, well, we still want these wonderful free trade deals. What are we going to do? We're going to have to negotiate them bilaterally with other people. We'll, you know, we'll take it to a another level. We'll have to circumvent the WTO. So that's where it came from. So I don't think things could be much worse. The, you know, if the UK external trade policy would be conducted within the WTO, right? I don't think it'd be much worse. What I would say is, again, it's all contingent on a different guy running the country, sure, but... I mean, that's why we're in politics, right? If we didn't think, I mean, this is the thing, people go, oh, the left, the, the right's going to govern for 20 years. Well, if you really believe that, I mean, why bother? You know, I'll go and get my football coaching badges. I won't, you know, I wouldn't be doing this. You're doing it because you think you can change things. Um, but there are elections in four. Yeah, but we would leave the EU in, what, 2017, 2018? They wouldn't be able to get rid of any statute before then. I mean, and that's, that's, a, and that's really important, right? Nothing big could happen before the next general election. I mean, realistically. Um, and in regard to the WTO, um, yeah, I think a left-wing British government trying... Again, I don't see Corbyn's an ambitious guy. They're not this ambitious. We need major reform of the international financial institutions, WTO, the IMF, World Bank. Now, I think there are only a handful of countries that can do this. Britain is one of them. Now, the left, again, you know, my dad's Iranian. I talk about Anglo-Iranian oil, BP. I know colonialism. I know Britain's history. The left's very like, oh, God, Britain, let's not talk about how it does punch above its weight. Well, it does. Okay, so how about if you get a socialist as prime minister, you might actually be able to do something about the IFIs. Britain could do that. America could do that. Germany could do that. China could do that. You know, there, there are some countries that could do this. Britain's one of them. I think let's give it a shot. And it's a lot quicker than 28 member states all changing and a new EU. I mean, if that happens, that's going to take a long time. But there is, there is something else there, and we are talking in the possibility that Corbyn is going to be in the next government. I wish I would believe so much <laughs> on <laughs> liberal <laughs> democracy that I would say, and then we are saved. And I don't think we will be. This is why another thing that it is happening, and it is happening within the European Union, is that you have different alliances created between countries, but between people, progressive forces, let's say. So it's not only if Corbyn is going, Corbyn will need support. And there will be some forces there to support him. And these are forces that they come from the European left, some of the socialists in the EU, Greens potentially, and so on. So we have something in there in order to start be building alliances. And in case we have left governments having more support. Okay, this brings us very neatly uh, onto the next issue that we want to tackle, and that is that of democracy. Um, I'm going to do something unpleasant again. I'm oh. going to quote Nigel Farage. <laughs> Bear with me. Okay, uh, I'm not going to try and do an impression of his voice. Um, a, sup a supranational beast sweeping aside national sovereignty completely. The EU is not undemocratic, it's anti-democratic. That's, that's Nigel Farage. Um, and here's one for you. Um, Greece isn't a democracy, now it's run through a troika. Three foreign officials that fly into Athens airport and tell the Greeks what they can and can't do. Nigel Farage, not me. Um, so this is my question for you, which I think a lot of people will be very, very interested in. On the British left, the treatment of Greece has become a one of the main issues, I would say, for why the, a lot of the British left is being told to vote for Brexit. Why are you, as a Greek activist uh, and a member of Syriza, arguing for the European, the EU project, and that the UK should stay in the EU? Yes, sure. First of all, I have to say that when we were saying on July 12, 2015, that there was a coup in Greece, there was a coup in Greece. It wasn't a metaphor that we were using or anything like that. There was seriously a coup and we were defeated. And we have to say that as well, then try to play something different. But I think what happened there, or what happened from my perspective, is that what we show is that the European Union didn't show the political will that it needed, and it didn't stick to its own treaties. Mm -hmm. And this is how technocracy works. So when, for example, the Greek government was saying, no, we cannot take decisions like that within the Eurogroup, but it has, they have to be taken by the European leaders, it was actually trying to do that, bring politics back 
and the people and the voice of the people via the referendum back at the heart of the EU. So seriously, there is a democratic deficit there. But it's not because, in from the way I see it, because of the foundations of the EU, but of how the EU, what the EU has uh, become. Now, in Britain, there are the other issues that they bother me a lot. I think they may bother you as well, since you are a Europeanist. And we have, in a very short time, I feel, to, to learn all together and try to understand what the EU is, something that it hasn't happened, I don't know, for how many years. And there are these accusations flying that the EU is undemocratic and so on, which I will agree with that. The problem is that you have to know where it is undemocratic and how we intervene and how we change that. So in relation to the Commission, for example, and I think you brought the Commission at, at some point as a bureaucracy, the Commission, now I know that I will be very much on the European side, sometimes it happens, is that the, the Commission is the civil service, which you have, by the way, on the national level as well, and I haven't seen being contested on national level as well. The commissioners are appointed by elected governments, which in, across Europe they are mainly Tory and neoliberal. Yeah? And this is the civil service that you have. So they are unelected, true, they are unelected, but we have to remember that they are appointed by the elected governments. So when we say that the EU is undemocratic, I have a proposal there, a small proposal, but I think we should do something. If we won't change within the Commission, on the national level, we have more scrutiny of who is appointed mm -hmm. as a commissioner and what their portfolio is. And the same will go when our elected governments go and negotiate on our behalf within the EU. Usually, they bring back what happened in the negotiations. Within the national parliaments, we want more debate before scrutiny, before they go in the EU. I think it may not sound big. I have other proposals as well, but I will leave it when you will ask us about the future. The future. Okay, I have that as well. Okay. Um, Aaron, okay, so I've got a quick... Uh, Can I respond to that quickly about the e Commission? Okay, go on. I mean, the Commission is a civil service, Marina, but, I mean, it's pretty unique. It's got agenda-setting powers, no other sort of bureaucracy in the world has that. I mean, it has a lot of executive functions, and it's a bit disingenuous, so it's just a bureaucracy like Whitehall, isn't it? No, what, what you have to remember is that in Britain, I think, I don't think, I've been in debates that most people, they don't know what the Commission is doing. They don't know who has to, uh, they think that the Commission is just making laws, and if the Commission says so, that's it. It becomes law, and this is not the truth. So what I'm saying there, it's not that there is not a problem with the Commission. As I said, there are proposals there, but we have to be very specific and know how this undemocratic institutions work, what are our proposals, how we go on campaigning and how we intervene. Okay, so my question to Aaron on this point is that even if we leave the European Union, we're still going to be, want to be part of it in some way. I mean, I don't know if you're arguing to leave the, the economic area as well, but it's still going to be this enormous thing that's going on. Uh, it's still going to have a massive influence over our country, except we won't be able to have any kind of power in it. And for me, like that sounds like something that's undemocratic, not having any kind of vote or any kind of say in an institution that is uh, dominating your like your country and your life. I, I want to I'll, I'll address that. I want to go to the, the Farage quote. And I'm going to say he was right. Okay, and I think that the EU in around 2011 went from undemocratic to anti-democratic. They imposed Mario Monti, this managerialist government, on the Italians because they were so worried about Berlusconi. And it's it, Italy, fourth biggest bond market in the world. That would sink the eurozone pretty quickly if they left it. And then, likewise, in Greece, they um, imposed the Papademos government onto Greece. So these were these were these were cherry-picked politicians to lead countries, right? I mean, wow. And then, in a similar vein. Uh, during the Oki stuff, the ECB tries to start a run on Greek banks once it's clear that Syriza wants, you know, uh, an Oki boat, right? Mm. And again, it moved, that really betokened to me, like a move from, okay, it's undemocratic to outright anti-democratic. You know, I look at Jaron Gisselboom, this is not an, uh, this guy is an anti-democrat. 
you know, just unbelievable. It couldn't be more anti-democratic. He couldn't hate the will and the sovereignty of the people yeah. more, this guy. I wish I could say I love him, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and, then I just, and then your point about, um, and your point about it would still be there, absolutely would be. And I'm sure lots of people here go, Aaron, that's all very well and good about Corbyn. It's pie in the sky. It's improbable. Let's use a more scientific word, right? Possibly it's improbable. Maybe, right? I think it's more probable than genuine reform of the EU. I, I statistically believe that. I statistically think it's far more likely we'll have a left-wing coalition government in this country than meaningful reform of the EU. Now, why is that? What would it take to reform the EU to have a more democratic Europe? What would it take? It would take, I would say, two left-wing governments in, in the following three countries. Britain and France, France and Germany, Fra Britain and France, Britain and Germany, France and Germany, right? The combination. I think it probably would have to involve Germany. I think it probably would have to involve Germany, right? S SPD right now. German centre-left party. Mm -hmm. What are they polling at? 21%. Low 20s. Maybe somebody in Germany is going to correct me. It was low 20s. I saw it a few weeks mm -hmm. ago. Alternative for Deutschland. Where are they polling? 16%. Right? The CDU and the CSU running the show in Germany. That's not going to stop anytime soon. So the, the domestic German context informs this as well. And that's not moving for 10 years. So if you're just saying, how do we make Europe more democratic? You're all, everything you're saying is correct. Right? But if the best reason to stay in this thing is that, oh, it's better in than out, and the, I mean, wow. I'd rather sort of just, you know, a bit, bit, bit of historical arsenal and just burn the thing down. And we'd still be in the EAA, because I don't think, if I thought reform was possible, I, I would really go for it. I just, statistically, it just seems so unlikely to me. So is your position that you're, um, that you're not against the EU as a concept? but you're against it because of the governments that are running it. I mean, would there be, if you did have, um, I did like uh, Syriza, Podemos, Labour, Delinka, all the rest of it in charge, I mean, would, you be, would you be happy in that kind of EU? Well, I mean, the demand from DM about um, you know, the European Parliament being sovereign, I think it's a great demand, and I'm well up for that. I'm well up for a federal European super state, and the executive and the legislatures, they're voted on, and we vote for them, and it's like the United States, I have no problem with that. It's not going to happen, right? For the reasons I've said, primarily, I think it's a constellation of three different families of nation, and then I just don't think the Germans would... There's, there's a German domestic dynamic which will impede it for a generation. So it's not going to happen. ECB, because you mentioned it. I have to say, that I, I agree with you, the ECB, in the case of Greece, it, plays a very, it played a very political role. Actually, it went against the treaties that they exist in the EU. If you look at the treaties, it says that it should manage the crisis for the European Union. There are other th founding treaties which are about solidarity. And instead of doing that, you have one case where you see the dominant forces within the um, uh, EU using the European Central Bank as a political tool to bring down a left-wing government and they were quite successful in a certain way but that should not stop us from go on fighting on all these level that i mentioned another thing that it happened from the uh, which i think it's quite important from the greek crisis is that you saw that this block that it was quite unified especially the social democratic parties going along and saying yeah this is the way forward more austerity blah 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 there was a crack there this is what it, it is interesting me in politics this is the possibilities that I, that I see opening, not that it's going to happen immediately, and what with what I want to work and make a difference. Okay, I think this would be a good moment to maybe open uh, up the floor for questions from, uh, from our audience. <coughs> Does anyone have a question? We've covered <coughs> refugees, we've covered climate change, migration. Ah, brilliant. Okay, let's go here. Uh, oh, John, are you doing the roving mic? So what we need is for the person who is asking the question to stand up. Cheers. <laughs> well, hi, that was uh, really quite interesting from both sides. Um, and actually, Aaron, what I was hearing from you, I just honestly couldn't believe. And I had to stop myself on several occasions to just shout out. So I just want to ask one question. What makes you think that you're going to be better off 
with your hands tied and gagged, standing by while the EU affect their regula uh, inflict their regulations on on the UK uh -huh. and not being able to do anything about it. I'm going to take a few yeah. questions. Cause I write that down. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, I guess my question will be, uh, in the beginning I just said I was one of the persons which is still, will be undecided on what to do on the end of June. The truth is I can do nothing because I'm not a British citizen. Um, but I'm a deeply Europeist person and my question would be, could there be a leave vote from a Europeist uh, perspective saying that this would be such a big shock to the rest of Europe that a core group of country, which is, as we said, Germany and probably its Western satellites, to actually go into the fed a federal government. Mm -hmm. So could that be a possibility and strategy for a Europeist way to do the leave campaign or okay. just wishful thinking? <coughs> Interesting. Yeah. Would you mind? Oh yes, then leave thank you. Uh, do you think that the um, antithesis that you posed is the wrong one? As far as I understood your um, discussion so far, you uh, counterposed Europe uh, versus the UK or Britain, I call it. Uh, so transnational versus national. But this uh, antithesis, uh, to my mind, is wrong is the wrong antithesis, because as it happened in, in Greece, it was the concerted uh, uh, capitalist n nations in Europe versus the Greek people, and, as, uh, and its representative Syriza. So when that happened, the, the collapse of Syriza, um, it didn't collapse, that was fine. Well, it was collapsed when it collapsed. I mean, yeah. not a... No, as you say, it was a coup. Uh, then this movement, DiEM, grew out of that. It made it a, a, it made it a European question. It's not an, a national question. Europe versus, you know, the strong versus the, the weak, breaking its own mm -hmm. treaties. So my question is, should the, should the antithesis be changed mm -hmm. as you brought it out? Socialist policies are becoming illegal. So that means the will of the people, the interests of the people, working, middle class, any people in Europe, the, the industrial, um, uh, in industrialism and the whole of the economies, how they run, whether the for uh, whether they take any account of environmental policies or not. Um, how, yeah. So this is uh, how we pose the antithesis. What do you think? Brilliant. Okay, I'm going to take those three questions. Um, okay, so first of all, Aaron, question from the floor. What makes you think you'll be any better off uh, gagged and having your hands tied whilst the EU imposes uh, legislation upon the UK? I mean... You could actually say the same thing about right now with external trade policy and, you know, the EU, the, the European Commission decides trade policy with the WTO. Member states have no, they have no, uh, they have no say. I think if Britain left the EU, okay, what would happen? I think the, the EU would have big existential problems, right? Let's model what happens. It probably wouldn't exist in its current form. I think it probably would then, we then have something which would approximate a federal super state. But then I don't, then you'd need euro bonds. And I don't think that the German, sort of the German electorate's willing to do that. Um, I don't think they're actually willing to go the, the, the sort of you know the full Monty on on um, on monetary union. So the EU would have an existential crisis. I think something more concrete would come out of it. And I think Britain would probably end up leaving the uh, European Economic Area. So the idea that they would still be tied to this stuff, I don't know if that's necessarily uh, necessarily the case. Okay, thank you. I think it'd be the, ra the ramifications would be so big. I don't think we should necessarily think in those terms. Okay, Marina, is uh, is there a chance, do you think, that a leave vote could 
create such a shock that it could force some kind of federalist uh, organisation to come into existence around Germany? No, because... Because I don't think that's where we are, because as I was saying before, I think you see nationalisms, you see people breaking up, inter uh, national interest coming to the forefront, no communitarian uh, spirit. Is that the question? Am I, did I get it correct? Uh, yeah? yeah, pretty much. There would be the conditions yeah. for this kind of um, shock in Europe, in case of Britain living. The, there have been two big shocks in the EU. One, it was the economic crisis and what followed, and the case of Greece it became the visibility. The same was the refugee crisis, another big, big shock. In both cases, we saw that the EU was much less than what we wanted. Mm -hmm. But where the power goes and what we see emerging from that, and I think this is the case for, for Greece as well, is xenophobia, is nationalism, is the right the far right, the fascist, taking advantage of that. I wish I could say something more optimistic, I think, but I, 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 this is how I perceive um, the situation. Okay, and then, and then both of you, just quickly, um, or have we, is, is the way we've been looking at the debate wrong? Should we, rather than framing it as in Europe versus the UK, should we be looking at it in, uh, through the lens of Capital versus uh, people, mm -hmm. and and what and how does that affect your your arguments for leave or remain? So because yeah. you're looking at me, sorry, I didn't. Yeah. Know. Uh, I think you could say that, and we have to say to remember though that when we are talking about how the the debate is framed from the mainstream, <coughs> it is. Europe versus UK, and this has been going on in Britain forever. Not amongst our circles, more mainly, but the media have always framed this uh, debate whenever the EU and very badly communicated in the mainstream media, it is always us and them. But I think you are right, probably we shouldn't think on these national terms, and we should start thinking of the creation of the people of Europe. We are not there yet. I don't think we have this, uh, this identity. I don't think we are there yet to understand ourselves as one collectivity. And I don't mean in geographical terms or in us, the people of Europe and the power of the people of Europe. I think Greece was the first instance that people realized that what was happening in this small country, probably it says something about the situation of the rest of us as well. But this is why we start from building movements from the ground to create, and I think th this is the attempt of the M25 as well, to create a people of Europe that they come together and they demand change. That's an attractive proposition, no? Yeah, so I, I think absolutely we should look at it as um, labour versus capital. I don't think, you know, that's a, obviously it's the frame you should look at any social conflict through. Um, but like you say, this is the question we're confronted with also. I mean, the big question is here, people might not like to hear it, is Britain part of Europe? Is the big question, historically, right? Is it part of Europe? Europe is a, you know, Metternich once said, Italy isn't a country, it's a geographical expression. Okay? Now, the same is arguably the case for Europe. It's a geographical expression. Now, this is an island which has a particular history in regard to a global empire. I think there's something interesting to be asked there, right? If you look at why, why, did, okay, why did Britain join the EU? Didn't, there wasn't there the Treaty of Rome in 57, right? They wanted to join in 63. De Gaulle said, sling your hook. They finally joined in 73. Now, why did it take Britain so long, right? Because British capitalism was tied up into its, you know, in, in colonialism, right? Its colonies, the British Empire. And then they were looking at growth rates, they're looking at rates of return, profitability, they're looking at German capitalism, Italian capitalism, even Greece, Greece in the 50s, economic growth, like boom, like that, and say, we want a part of that. You know, so this is not good. All these captive colonial markets we have, forget about it. We want to be part of this Western European party. And they went there instead, and that was a, that was in the interest of a particular class of people in Britain, the capitalist class was in their interest. There was a higher rate of profitability going on in Western European capitalism than British imperialist capitalism. And yeah, there was never this idea that, oh, we need to make Europeans. And I, I feel European. I went on Erasmus. I speak very good Italian. I love Dante and Goethe. Do I think that most British people feel European? Probably not. And also, you know, as an extension of that, most Scots do. 
right? So there are also internal, uh, internal contradictions here. Another thing we're not talking about is if Britain did leave. I think it would almost certainly be the end of the Union. And I don't say that flippantly. I think it would be, right? We're going to come to that. <coughs> Sorry. No, no, we're definitely going to come to that. I'm going to take three more questions. Oh, got an instant cluster over there. Can we have a, a mic? Oh. Where are we going? Uh, there was one, two, three, all round. Yeah. Italy had the global empire, and the Austro-Hungarian was multicultural. Um, Who else had the global empire, sorry? Italy. 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 When? Um, the Roman Empire. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a point. Okay. Um, you're condemning the EU for being, at best, no more than a drag break on neoliberalism and Thatcherism. And then you talk about a left-wing government, but if you take the break off, in what way would that do other than strengthen the already in place right wing government? Right. Should, should we ask that or should we wait for more? I'm going to take two more All right, now. questions. Yeah, yeah just a, a very simple point. I mean, when you talk about the prism of labour versus capital, and, and that, that just seems such a reductive prism when, um, you know, um, the concept of uh, war and peace and security uh, for a lot of people is the main. Uh, strength that the European Union and the project has, has brought, and uh, I think that's um, probably more important in a lot of people's eyes. Okay, thank you. Last last question. Um, yes, look, I'm, I'm preoccupied about how we get messages out to people. And you've, you've alluded to the fact that the media is just killing all, all debate and, and you know covering over everything and not allowing what we would want to talk about to come through. Um, I'm also a bit shocked that at the mayoral election only 45% of Londoners actually voted. It's great what happened, but there was only 45% of Londoners that turned out to vote. And I'm also thinking about Obama and how he got in, and it was largely through, I think, using social media. So there's a sort of a mixed bag of things there. And what I'm concerned about is I've been doing a lot of canvassing on the doorstep. A bit shocked at how many really hardcore Labour voters, when asked the question about remain or leave, say, I really don't know. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important point. Democracy right here. How do we, how do we galvanise people? Um, Aaron, do you want to tackle the first question? Yeah, <clears throat> um, it's absolutely true. Australia Garrett, Empire was, um, was multicultural. If anything, that goes to show, I don't like to, again, I don't like to say it, but it goes to show that imperial powers are more prone to multi-ethnic identities than nation states, right? In other words, the Ottoman Empire, for instance. Um, and in terms of the, the handbrake argument, I've got a big idea, which again, Marina may disagree with, many people may disagree with here, and it's about changing public attitudes with younger people. And I'm looking at the next 10, 20, 30 years here. And the politics that we're talking about, that counter-revolution of Thatcher, but let's take it even before then, right? This was, this was, a, this was a consequence of a the failure of a particular kind of capitalism in the early 1970s, okay? And they make the most of it. In the early 1970s, profitability in America and the United Kingdom was very low. Workers' wages were going up all the time. Now, in capitalism, that doesn't work. You need to reassert a particular relation. Okay? So you have globalization, you have outsourcing, and you also have a political project which smashes organized labor. So it wasn't nasty Tories, nasty Republicans. It was a response to a crisis of capitalism. Right? That's my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. Now, that counter-revolution has been happening for decades. And I think we're coming to the end of it. I thought we'd come to the end of it in 2008, but I was mistaken, right? Now it's more hardcore than ever before. But if you look at, for instance, um, like I said, public attitudes in the United States, the age that Sanders supports, is, this is just astonishing, I think it was the New Hampshire primary, Sanders amongst under 30s beat Hillary by 6 to 1. Obama beat her by 20%, 30% amongst that demographic. It was a much, much bigger you know, change. So younger people have much more progressive values than older people, not just in U the US, but also in the UK. There's 20 million millennials in the UK, by the way. A lot of people, like I say, last election they voted Green and, and Labour. Um, and we're moving towards Europe and the US becoming minority majority countries. Brown and black people will, out will outnumber white people. Now, given all of that, given climate change, given the failure of neoliberalism, given a security crunch, I think loads of stuff's going to change. And I don't think that the Tories are going to govern for 20 years. And I don't think, you know, I think we're going to see huge challenges 
to the system, right? Economic system, political system, cons you know, how can sense bid manufacture and so on. So, yeah, that's the answer to the first question. Oh, the other question is great. I'd love to answer them too. Yeah, no, we, get, we will. I, w I just, uh, Marina, I'd like to get your um, view on this because it's something that David Cameron, amongst other people, has been talking about, but which, which is an issue that a lot of people take very seriously, which is the impact of the European Union in bringing peace uh, and, and stability to, to Europe. Do you think that's something that, that you know, that we should be proud of and that should, there should be more emphasis on? Or do you think the risk of war if, uh, for, if without the EU is, is a great one? I, I, th Sorry. I, I think on that one we have to... I, I agree that it brought peace and you started with your presentations about what the European Union meant after the Second World War. At the same time, I would have to say that there were conflicts within the EU as well. There was bombing of Kosovo, Serbia, and so on. So the conflict was uh, there. But if I have to say something about war and peace, and I will throw that to Aaron, I think, if you want to leave something, leave NATO. Why hasn't all these years that we have has been NATO. going around, <laughs> you, we are still everybody in NATO? <laughs> Thank you, Maureen. Right. No, that, so that last question, um, and then we go, and then I'm going to bring us back to this idea of the future. But I suppose as part of looking at the future, how do we galvanise people um, to get them engaged in politics and, and debates like this? Um, so again, my thinking is so premised on the inability to reform the EU. So the reason why I say the things I do, you may say, well, this doesn't make sense. Or I, I don't think. The most, the most Eurosceptic parts of the country, I think uh, the most Eurosceptic is the northeast of England, right? Labour country, UKIP finishing second, a lot of these places, 121 second places last election, something like that. You can't tell these people, we can change the EU, we're going to do this, reform is possible if you don't think it's possible. Now, I don't think it's possible, and I've outlined why, right? The primary reason being you'd need a, a reforming government in Germany, that's not going to happen for a very long time. So, how do you galvanise people? I think the first thing has to be you're honest with them. Um, and then secondly, which I, I think DM does very well is, you have to very clear demands which would mobilise specific social constituencies. So this idea of we would have a, you know, a, a fully elected uh, legislature and that's where sovereignty would reside, fantastic. Very easy to understand, right? So that would be, and I, you're already doing it. So I'd say honesty and then clear demands. Thank you. Maureen, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, about quite a few, I think. <laughs> <laughs> because it is about media as well, yeah? Yeah, yes, yeah, we have, yes. First of all, when I hear, I, I go to your point about capitalism and, and these divisions, I, I think one of the things that as I have moved quite away from these reductionisms, yeah, I cannot, uh, I cannot take it when everything is reduced to this economic analysis which is always capitalism and capitalism. And we have to move away from that, to, to look at how economy is part of politics and put politics back at the center of everything. Uh, this was a point I think that you you were making. In terms of young people, I, I, I teach politics, yeah? but we have a problem because we are talking about a university that it is changing very fast, which means that our relationship is changing. The relationship we have in universities are changing, and a lot of people who will be paying nine thousand uh, pounds, they will be people that they are customers. Yeah, we are moving towards that from the side of universities and <coughs> from the side of students as well. I mean, if you see university as a place where you could have debates and engage people and do something there, of course, I hope you will say that there was a movement of students uh, and so on. But I still find what I'm saying the change in the university quite problematic. Mm. And then we I come to the media, and you're doing media much better and in practice, and you're so good at social media. I The problem I have, but it may be because I'm uh, not very good at that, is that social media sometimes, they represent for me clusters of people talking to each other without understanding the broader pictures that they are happening. It may be because I'm not very good at that. So I would go back to a, a mixed 
ecology if you want how do you talk to people how you bring messages out first of all in terms of mainstream media occasionally we have chances to use them Varoufakis has chances to use them he became a celebrity and he used them for good he said things that a lot of people heard because we have to remember media as well they are not as monolithic as they are represented sometimes they want to sell and Varoufakis was very good in presenting himself. He took quite a lot of air time, and I think he used it for good in that case. But we don't have that many uh, chances that often. So we have to use the mainstream media. We have to use social media. But I'm still interested in the old ways. You have to go out. You have to talk to people. You have to have contact. And nothing is going to substitute, substitute that. Okay, so I'm going to move us on to our closing issue, which is that of the future. Now, um, Yanis Varoufakis, um, former finance minister of Greece, believes that Brexit would mean the dissolution of the EU and the creation of an ultra-nationalistic, toxic social conservatism and, um, around migration and economic, like, e economics. He believes that this would result in a power vacuum and a fer and fertile ground for the right, the bigots and the ultra-nationalists and the fascists of Europe like Marine Le Pen. In short, Brexit means driving Europe off a cliff and it is a situation where the left will not make gains and where we could find ourselves in a kind of postmodern 1930s. The UK, if this happens, will ultimately also be get sucked in to the vortex of this collapsing Europe. My question, therefore, to both panellists is how do we change the balance of power in Europe to turn back the forces of the far right um, and to take back control from transnational capital? What should we do to create that one simple but very radical idea to democratise Europe? Marina. How much time I have for that? It's a very big <laughs> question. The, the first thing we have to understand and we have to accept that neoliberalism has won because in terms of the public domain, the main narratives are neoliberal. People accept them as common sense, even if it is about economics, if it is about politics, and this is where TTIP is coming out. There is no other solution. And this is a huge hegemonic victory that they have. So we have to start changing these narratives. And this doesn't mean that somebody will come out and they will say, no, this narrative is not uh, true. It needs constant work <coughs> all the time. But again, in terms of the future, about how do we democratize the EU, I think I talked about these three different levels. Create movements, change national governments, create alliances within the EU. But I have more particular proposals when it comes to the democratization of the EU. And you said something that the nation states play no role within the EU. They always can veto certain decisions. For example, nobody, I think, vetoed the decision between EU uh, and, and Turkey. Yeah? So let's not reduce everything that there is no space nowhere and let's look where the space is but also in terms of democracy i think one of the issues and one of the campaigns that we have to put forward and i think bm25 is in a good place of doing that is about transparency and transparency when there are deals when the documents are on and for but at the same time, on, on, on the national level as well, what role British governments are playing in the EU and so on. The second, it will be more democracy. Again, am I going too fast? I got tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, on that level, we have to look at the institutions and how they work. And because the Commission is coming up all the time, my proposal will be before any government, let's campaign, before every gov any government appoints a commissioner, let's scrutinize them. It should go through national parliaments. We should know who there is. By the way, the commissioner of um, Greece, for example, he, he's not a, a left series of person. He is somebody who has quite a lot of experience in the EU, and I think he's coming from the Conservative Party. Yeah? So 
we have to scrutinize these issues on the national level in order to start building democracy that uh, it will work on transnational level as well. Are, are you fed up with me? Did I go on? No, I'm not at all fed up with you. No, I think it's absolutely fascinating. Um, Aaron. I mean, the thing about neoliberalism, <coughs> Sanders and Corbyn and Ada Colau and Manuela Carmena in Spain, their success is a symptom of obviously neoliberalism is in, is in crisis. But so is increasingly the rise of Donald Trump, right? I don't know if people are aware of this the last few days. He's saying he would look at the minimum wage being increased. Hmm. And, uh, you know, he, so a lot of the stuff he's talking about could be, I mean, these were nominally social democratic measures in the 1930s. So he thinks the minimum wage should be increased. He, he's saying he likes unions. There's now Teamsters for Trump. Um, and he says he wants tariffs imposed on imports to help American jobs. Okay. Now, a lot of his key frames are coming directly from Sanders. And he knows to beat Clinton, he's going to have to say a lot of this stuff. So I think that's symptomatic of a crisis of, crisis of neoliberalism as much as anything else. And incidentally, what would be the most popular politics in Britain? I think it would be what you could call Red UKIP. Right? in the abstract, right now, what would be the most popular politics? So that would be a politics which is economically left-wing, but anti-immigration and racist and Islamophobic. And if it was done by, if it was conducted by a charismatic conservative politician, they would clean up, right? So on a lot of the economic stuff, I think we're there, actually. It's around migration, it's around internationalism, um, it's around who and who isn't human, who is allowed, who is afforded or furnished human rights, which is, I think, the big terrain now. Um, so yeah, and for me personally, I operate more at the level of uh, civil society, ideas. I try and persuade people, uh, and that's what Navarro does. You know, we try and change people's minds, and it's about constructing a different kind of hegemony, like I say, a different kind of common sense. That's going to take a very long time. Um, it's very granular, um, but it, it has to be done. And I think, again, I'll finish with this. I think one of the limits of, oh, let's defend the EU, it's this good thing, is it's, you can't have this, I like the idea of the EU, I like a lot of the things it does, but the idea that you can put this kind of, this structure over the realities of Europe and over these dissenting voices of European publics, you know, I mean, Hungary, for instance, I mean, Jesus Christ, the sort of public debate there is so racist, right? That then you can just put this thing over it and say, oh, it's all quiet, it's all cleaned up, great. I saw on the, one of the slides here, we have to help Poland and Hungary. Keeping them in the EU means that the right doesn't come to power kind of thing and they can't do racist stuff. I mean, that's not sustainable, is it? Because it's not democratic. I mean, people aren't going to put up with that. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 the big struggle is it's an electoral one. It's a big big political one, but also it's one of ideas in civil society. And I, you know, that takes a very long time. And it's about, you know, um, creating counter power, I think, through media as much as anything else. That would be my number one aim. Okay, a final word from you, Marina, on that idea of balancing um, the, democ the democratic aims of a wider European <laughs> Union with the democratic desires of individual states. How do you think that is really compatible? Yeah, I think, I think it is compatible. And what we should be looking for is a union that it will uh, accept difference. We have our differences, but this should not be the main uh, priority. Can I reply something to Aaron? One of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm always, th I'm inviting you to think it with me, not uh, necessarily to, uh, is that from what you were saying about Trump, how flexible is neoliberalism? How easily they can take ideas that they come, they don't care if they come from Sanders or from the left or whatever, and incorporate them in a, in a narrative that it will be for their own benefits. The problem for me, for the left, it is that it is inflexible sometimes, it always has the same reductionist analysis, and we don't move with the times and getting into the things and trying to change things. I Trump's a fascist, he's not a neoliberal. I mean, yeah. Marine Le Pen wants to nationalise industry. I mean, yeah, but the, the same is for neoliberalism, I think, as well. If they have managed to do anything, is that they can take ideas very, very easily. They don't care. They don't care if an idea that I will have, if I'm left, if it is useful, they will take it. They will incorporate it. The problem is the left, that's my problem, that it is inflexible, it goes on with the same analysis and sometimes it becomes very wooden, it cannot respond to the re reality 
that it has in front of it. And that's what I would like to change, and I hope this, that's what these debates are doing. Okay, so for our people who were undecided, has, do we still have any more undecided people in the room? Does everyone, does everyone feel like they've... everyone's probably become undecided. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, then. First person's become undecided. Well, um, I, hope, I hope that this evening has shown, you know, that the left is not always inflexible, uh, but that we do engage in, you know, dynamic... <laughs> Uh, and, and very, you know, yes. very important um, debates. Um, we've kind of had a little <coughs> stop tour through um, some of the most sort of pertinent, controversial issues around the EU. And I would very much like to thank our two panelists for giving us just an extraordinary tour of the political ideas surrounding um, the EU. So thank you both very much. Great, well, so um, unless there's any uh, announcements from you, John, about future events, um, all I can say is follow uh, Lundim25 on Twitter and on Facebook. That's where we post um, messages and uh, notifications about future events that are coming up. And um, if you're feeling inspired by the campaign or by anything that you've heard this evening, you know, do feel free to approach. Um, John or George or myself, uh, you know, about how you could potentially uh, get involved in, in DM25. And thanks for being a fantastic audience as well. Thank you.